so good to be with you tonight. The Lord was really moving in worship tonight. Really felt the presence of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. He's so good. God is so good. I don't know about y'all, but it's just been, um, I, I know it's only Wednesday, but it just feels like this has been the longest week so already. <laughs> Uh, I know when everybody got home Monday night, we were all just exhausted. We were just worn out, finally, a night at home. I mean, you know, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak, and we were just thankful to have a night of rest. And last night, we went back to the old house and got a load and brought it back with us, so still kind of in the process of getting a few things, and it's just been, it's been a lot. I just feel like there's so much still left to do, and um, the weight of life. It can be so heavy at times and we're just exhausted. A lot of the time we get up, I know myself in the mornings and it just seems like the day just hits you. The kids need you. There's things to do. We're just so busy and we spend our time just focusing so much on the things of this world and the tasks and jobs that we have to do, which is right and good. And you know, you got to feed the kids. You got to go to work and make money and there's just things you have to do. So the Lord understands that. But but lately, I've just really been feeling on my heart that we need to be more mindful of walking in the Spirit and what's really going on in the world right now and what God is desiring to do in the Spirit. And that's what I want to talk to you all about tonight, life in the Spirit, how we need to seek first the kingdom of God and all this other that we're dealing with on this earth. He's going to take care of it. If we'll just seek his face first, if we'll just be fully committed to do what he's called us to do, I have felt that so heavily, to just press into his presence and to just go in a little deeper, let him lift us up a little higher and really show us the importance of this time that we are living in and why he has placed us here and the purpose of going out and reaching the people and telling them about Jesus. I've had such a burden on my heart, and I know that you have to. I mean, you cannot be a Christian truly serving and loving the Lord and not have that burden on your heart, but even more so just seeing everything that's going on in the world around us. Um, so it's just so fitting that tonight we have made it to Romans chapter 8. Um this may be the last message that, that we're able to do. I don't know if we're going to meet again next week or not, but if we are, I'm hoping maybe we can get through as much as we can. We'll just see. But my teaching, really, I just feel to focus on the Holy Spirit. And we've been through so much already going through Romans. Um, and we learned in Romans chapter 6 that what Christ has done for us. But when you get to Romans chapter 8, you learn about what the Holy Spirit does in you. And I couldn't wait to get to this. I'm so glad I'm, I'm able to come to you tonight and to really hammer in everything we've been building on thus far and getting us to this point of understanding what it's like to walk in the Spirit, to understand what life in the Spirit is really like, having the power of the precious Holy Spirit working inside of you and enabling you, empowering you and helping you in everything that you do. And so before we really get into the Word, I want to go to the Lord in prayer one more time. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just thank you. We thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you, Lord, that you have already met with us. We thank you, Lord, that you are already doing a work in us, Father God. And I just pray, Lord, you would continue. Oh, we welcome your Holy Spirit. Stay with us. Move in us, Lord God. I just pray that something that I say tonight would touch your people, would help them to grow, would increase their understanding of you, Lord. It's my desire, Lord, that they would be fed tonight. Lord, that no one would go away wanting or empty, Lord God. Fill your people, Lord. Lord, touch your people in a way, Father, they've never felt before, oh God, filled to overflowing, strengthened and encouraged, Lord, for the days ahead. Draw us closer to you, Lord, in a way like never before. Open up your word to us in a way that we've never seen, Lord. We seek your face, Father God. 
Lord, we want to know you more. That's what it's all about, truly, Lord. Just to know you more, just to have a closer walk with you, Father. That is our heart's cry. And dear God, I just pray you would touch me tonight. I pray for your anointing, Lord. I covet it above all things. God, I pray that you would touch me, that every word that I speak would be of you, Father. Lord, I yield myself to you tonight. My mouth, Lord, is yours. God, I pray you let that river flow, that your people would be touched and blessed tonight. We give you all the praise, Lord, all the honor and all the glory. We thank you that you would come and that you would meet with us and that you would bless us, Lord, with your presence. And I just pray for each and every one here tonight, God. That you would touch them, that you would open the eyes of their understanding, Lord, that you would enlighten them, Lord, that they would see your word, Father, plant that seed in their heart tonight. And we're believing for great and mighty things, Lord, through this body. We thank you for it, Lord God. We thank you for the cross of Calvary. We thank you for the precious blood of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for giving us your precious Holy Spirit to come and to help us and to teach us and empower us, Lord. We give you praise praise and honor. We give you glory tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I love that Paul uses the word now. There is therefore now. We're not talking about something that the Lord desires to do someday in the future. The price has already been paid. It's already been afforded to you now, right now. If you are saved by the precious blood of Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation. You don't have to walk around feeling beat up or depressed or feeling like you're not good enough or that you don't qualify. We have been given the righteousness of Christ. We are in right standing with our Lord and Savior because of that sacrifice. And if you understand that, that on your own you are nothing, but through Christ all things are possible. Through Christ you can do anything. Through Christ and His precious Holy Spirit you can fulfill the call that He's placed on you, that you are able to do whatever it is that He's called you to do. Glory to God. There is now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. The flesh will bring condemnation. This world, others will bring condemnation upon you, but in Christ Jesus, when you are in the presence of God, when you understand that when Christ sees you, he sees his son, he doesn't see what we have to offer, which is nothing but unrighteousness and filthy rags, but through Jesus Christ, you can be an overcomer. Hallelujah. In the Greek, that word condemnation is katakrama. It means an adverse sentence or an unfavorable verdict. It really means you've been condemned to death. Because we know that without Christ, that is the road that we are all headed on. A life of defeat and eventually death. But through Christ... We've already been declared, as you know, not guilty. We have been set free, washed and cleansed and justified because of his precious blood. Which leads us to verse 2. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ... Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. We don't have to walk after the flesh anymore. Here we see the introduction of a law. Now this law is just like any other law that God created. He's the creator of all things, right? And if you can follow me on this, I'm going to try to explain it in the best way that I know how, but... The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is just like the law of gravity. It's just like his spiritual laws are just like the natural laws that we can see, but we have to understand that this is happening in the spirit. So the flesh, the law of the spirit 
of life in Christ Jesus makes us free from the law of sin and death. And when you are operating in the flesh, when you are not saved by the blood of Jesus, all that you have is sin and death because that's all that that law can produce. Just like how the law of gravity says that if you drop something, it's going to fall, right? Or what goes up must come down. Um, That is a law that cannot be broken except for the law that is of greater power, something that can defy gravity like the law of buoyancy or the law of aerodynamics. The law of gravity can be overcome by another law that is greater. So if you look at the law of sin and death as like the law of gravity, it's been overcome by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus because we have been given a greater power that overrides that law. It's not that that law doesn't any longer exist, um, if you understand what I'm trying to say here, because laws are unvarying. They're, they're not a theory. It's not a hypothesis. It's not something. It's already been proven. It's a fact. It won't change, and it can only be overridden, as I said, by a more powerful law. So this is something that you as a believer, you can operate in. And it's either one or the other. There's always going to be one trying to override the other. If you in any way want to take the path of law of sin and death, then that's going to lead to death and failure and defeat. There's no other way that that law operates. But if you choose Christ... Paul wants you to understand here what he's teaching here is if you have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are operating in the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That is leading to victory in your life, overcoming power in your life, joy and love and peace and goodness and gentleness. The fruit of the Spirit can grow in your life. You don't have to live in fear and doubt and worry. You don't have to go around defeated. But Satan would love to keep you bound and keep you chained and try to cause you to feel as though you don't truly have that victory. Once you understand how this law operates, once you understand that the only way it can operate is through the Spirit, it's not something that was ever designed for us to be able to control or operate ourselves. What you have to do is yield. You yield to the Spirit, and then the Spirit can operate in the law in which God designed it to. He never designed your flesh to operate in that law. That's why so many people out there are living in failure and defeat because they don't understand the way this law operates. So hopefully we can get a little better understanding of what the Lord desires for us to do in living in the Spirit. We know that life in the Spirit is talking about our daily conduct, the way that we carry ourselves. Pastor Luke already spoke tonight about our witness, and I've been thinking about this a lot. We've been talking about this a lot because we're preparing to go out and to witness. And when we do, what we are and how we portray ourselves to that person is going to be so much more believable than any piece of paper we're going to hand them or any scripture that we can quote them. When you are genuinely walking in the Spirit and your faith is anchored in Jesus Christ... You don't have a choice. That well is going to spring up in you. There's going to be life flowing out of you. The fruit of the Spirit is going to be evident in your life. And when you go out and you tell others about Jesus, let that light shine. Don't be afraid. Don't hide the light. Don't be intimidated. Don't be in fear. Those are tactics of Satan. And he wants you to keep you, to keep you in your flesh and keep you thinking with your carnal mind. But when you let the Spirit of God flow out of you, You can't help but tell of the goodness of God. You can't help but share your testimony of how he's brought you through and what he's done for you. And that, that's what wins souls. That's what draws the people. That's what causes them to truly believe because they want to see it in you. They want to see you living it out in your day-to-day life, in your witness, how you carry yourself, in the things that you say 
in the person that you are. And as you're getting closer and closer to the Lord, you can't help but become more and more like him. It's just a natural occurrence that happens when you're walking in the spirit. You're going to become more Christ-like. And the things that he desires for you will become your desires too. Those other things, they're just they're going to fall off. You're not going to want to live the life that you used to live. It's the sanctification process in work, at work in you on a daily basis. The flesh is pushy. The flesh will take advantage of you. The flesh is forceful. It wants what it wants. But we all know that the Holy Spirit is gentle like a dove. And he he comes in his own gentle way and he speaks to us in those still and quiet moments. He wants to be invited into your life. He wants to know that you want him there. He is easily quenched. We need to be careful and mindful of the way that the Spirit operates. And we need to yield and allow Him to move in us in the way that He wants to. Let's go to verse 3. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, Condemned sin in the flesh. So right here in verse 3, it tells us that the flesh could not keep the law. It wasn't designed by God to do that. We in our flesh cannot keep the law. And we prove that by trying to and failing. But God sending his own son... The perfect sacrifice, the perfect Lamb of God, the only one who was sinlessly perfect. You notice it says in the likeness of sinful flesh. Not that he was a sinner. My Jesus did not become a sinner on the cross. That sin did not send him to hell. He went down victorious. He took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. My Jesus did not become a sinner. He was sinlessly perfect. Until the very end, until he cried, it was finished. He came as a sin offering. He became our offering, and he condemned sin in the flesh. We are not condemned. The flesh has been condemned because of the power of what Jesus Christ did for us. He destroyed the work that the law of sin and death did in us. And now we have been restored to live in newness of life. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. No, verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now what the law actually came to do because of Jesus Christ, it can be fulfilled in us. Because we walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Glory to God. We understand that we do not walk according to our own strength or ability any longer. But we are walking in the Spirit. And there is such a rest and a refreshing in that, knowing that He did the work. And we can just rest in it. We can just walk in what He's already done and have victory. Verse 5, For they who are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they who are after the Spirit The things of the Spirit. So Paul's saying you might want to check yourself right now and see. What's controlling you? What are you living after? What are you going for? Are you focusing on the flesh? Or are you focusing on the things of the Spirit? And if you are truly saved and washed in the blood of Jesus, he's wanting to remind us. That we need to be walking after the Spirit. We need to be desiring the things that the Spirit desires. We need to be thinking about what the Lord is desiring to do in us and in the church on a daily basis. Because of Christ, we have been liberated. And as I said before... The law of the Spirit only works for the Spirit. It cannot work for us if we are trying to go about it in our flesh. We must yield. And the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus is the only thing that is more powerful than the law of sin and death. Because 
Sin and death brings death. And this reminded me of Romans 7, I believe it's 24. Romans 7 and 24, where Paul told us, um, he went where he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He understood that in chapter 7, as he's struggling with his flesh, he knows that it's only going to lead to death. And when a person, Brother Luke and I were speaking about this not too long ago. Um, We were talking about the, I know you've probably heard of it, the Egyptian practice that when a person was condemned to death, they would take a corpse and they would attach it to that person. And their punishment their death would be carrying that dead corpse on them until it eventually rotted to the point that it would infect that person's body and kill them. Can you imagine a punishment like that? Can you imagine death in that way? And that's a lot like what happens to us. I thought about that when when Paul said, who will deliver me from the body of this death? We have this law that is attached to us of sin and death, and we need to be delivered from that. We need to understand that the chains that once held us no longer have us bound. We are free. We can shake that off. We can lay aside that old dead man and we can move on in newness of life and what Christ has for us because we have already been crucified with Christ and buried with him and we are resurrected with him in newness of life that we can now walk in the spirit. And it's hard to walk in the spirit when you have all that dead weight on you. He desires for us to move, to get up, to go and fulfill the call. But we've allowed these dead weights, these chains to bind us and hold us down. But I want you to know you've been set free tonight. Glory to God. Verse 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. The carnal mind is an enemy of God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. It can't be because it was never designed to be. We have to understand the way this law operates. So then they who are in the flesh cannot please God. It's impossible. Without faith, the word of God says it is impossible to please him. And if you don't have your faith anchored in Jesus Christ, you can in no way please God. It means you are carnally minded and you are walking after the flesh. We have to understand what the spirit desires to do in us. I don't want to go unless the spirit of God is leading me. Just like the children of Israel, they didn't move until that cloud moved. The cloud of glory is moving. Let's move with the cloud. Move with the cloud. Amen. That's what I want to do. Let your spirit rise. Let your strength be renewed. Come on, let's move together. Strength you'll receive as you follow his lead. Move with the cloud. Let's move with the cloud. I want to go wherever the Spirit goes. Wherever He leads, I will follow. I'm just going with Jesus. I don't care about anything this world has to offer. I don't want to stay behind and be dry and lifeless. Wherever He's at is where I want to be. Wherever it's happening, that's where I want to go. I want to shake off all those heavy chains. I want to praise the name of Jesus. I want to go with Jesus. Glory to God. I don't want to be held down by this whole world. And the cares of this world. You can be set free tonight. And you can recognize that when the Spirit's moving. That He's going up ahead. If you have felt like the presence of God has left you. Then maybe it's time to move. Maybe it's just time to move with the cloud. And follow the leading of the Lord. Maybe it's because He said, you know, my sheep know my voice. They hear me. They follow me. Kind of sounds like we're moving, doesn't it? It sounds like he's going up ahead and you may be like, where did he go? Well, he never intended for you to stay where you are. You move when he moves. And when he says it's time to go, we got to get up and go. 
or else you're going to be left behind because time is short and I'm ready to go. If Jesus says it and he's going up ahead and his spirit is leading and he's making a way, what fear do we have? What fear of man should we have? What fear of this world or the circumstances or the the trials that may be up ahead, the obstacles in the way? He's already gone ahead. Our chief, our commander has already gone ahead. He's holding the shield. He's our mighty strong tower. He says, just come on. I'm I'm holding the line for you. And all you got to do is follow me. He's already won the victory. He's made it as easy as possible. All we have to do is yield and obey. Glory to God. That sounds like a good deal to me. Amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. I just want to get to Jesus. I just want to be in his presence. I feel like that woman with the issue of blood. I won't be denied. Don't hold me back. I'm going to press through the crowd just to touch the hem of his garment. Just to know that he's near. I want to be with him. I want to go with Jesus. Hallelujah. He's calling us to a higher place. Do you feel that? Do you believe that? It's time to move. Glory to God. Our carnal flesh will oppose God. There's no way that it can be subject to the law of God, to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And there's no way that we can please God as long as we are in our flesh. And what you focus on, this is what we're talking about, being carnally minded, living in the flesh. It's like having two paths. You know, we, we talk about the broad way and the narrow way. And the Lord has clearly defined the path for us. And he wants to give us life and life more abundantly. He's laid it out. The way may be narrow. And when you look at those paths, it may seem like that broad way is the, the bright and shiny way. And it's, it's, there's more room to go. And it looks like there's all these good things for you, all the plans that you had for your life. You see, Satan knows just how to lay it out just right. It's very tempting. And the narrow way may look a little rough and rocky and there may, may be some mountains you have to climb and some valleys you got to walk through. But he's already made the promise he would be with you. Even through the valley of the shadow of death, you can fear no evil. evil. He said, I'm with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Even though troubles and trials come, you can be of good cheer. He's already overcome the world. I want to take the path that leads to everlasting life life. The word of God says that those who have taken that broad way, they've already received their reward. I want to store up my treasures in heaven. Glory to God. And what you focus on is where you go. Have you noticed when you're driving and something distracts you and you look to the left or the right, you start to veer off the path? We need to be careful that we're keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ. We're keeping our eyes on the prize. We're forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward. Glory to God. We're not looking to the left or to the right. Our hands are on the plow. We're moving forward with Jesus. We know what he's called us to do. We know what lies ahead. We know he's before us. And we're ready to go with Jesus. So keep your focus on the Lord. Hallelujah. Verse 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. He's reminding us once again, you no longer have to live in the flesh. You can live in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you, and we know that it does. We know that we are saved by the blood of Jesus and his spirit dwells in us. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. This clearly tells us that if you do not have the Spirit of Christ living inside of you, you are not His. Then you need to get saved. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Because you have been born again. Glory to God. Know that you don't have to live in the flesh. You don't have to stay in that prison. The door has been open wide. And all you have to do is get up and walk out. Those chains, they don't bind you anymore. They've already been loosed. All you got to do is shake them off. Rise up and walk in victory. Glory to God. Hallelujah. If you are in the spirit, now you need to act like it. 
It's time to walk like it. It's time to talk like it. It's time to live a life in the Spirit. Glory to God. Because we have been given the power of the precious Holy Spirit, at the time of conversion, don't misunderstand. The moment that you are saved, your body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he comes to live and to dwell inside of you. Now, the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues is a separate work that we are all qualified for. All you have to do is be saved. What did Paul say? Have you received since you have believed? And they said, well, we just haven't even heard that there was such a thing. There's a lot of people out there who haven't. But if they are saved by the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit is living inside of them. So we cannot discount them. We can't toss them aside because they don't speak in tongues. They can still make heaven their home. They are still good enough to make it to heaven, and they are good enough for me. I don't know about you, but I call them my brother and sister in Christ, as we should. Um, And the fruit of the Spirit can grow in their life, and the sanctification process can take place in them. But they need to know that there is another gift that is available to them. And when you receive this, what a special gift. I mean, how can it not help any believer? I mean, it doesn't matter if you are called into the fivefold ministry. Paul didn't walk up to him and say, hey, are you called to preach or teach or evangelize? He said, have you received since you believe? That was the only qualification. So you need the power of the Holy Spirit in everything that you do, not just power for service. But we have this prayer language that we have been given. What a blessing to know that the Spirit makes intercession for us. And when you don't know how to pray, when you pray in the Spirit, the Spirit knows exactly how to pray according to the will of God. What a precious gift. Every believer can benefit from that. So it's important to understand that. And then you also have the gift of tongues which is laid out in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the nine gifts. And that's something that occurs quite frequently in this church, so we should be familiar with that. When a person gives a message in tongues, and then it is interpreted. And that specifically is to help encourage us as a body. It's the Lord himself speaking to us, giving us a word directly from heaven. It is a very special privilege that we have been given And I am thankful for those um, who will yield themselves to seek for these gifts because they are available to all. I love to see these gifts in operation in the church. It's very important. And the Word of God even says, pray that you would receive these. And if you have the gift of tongues, pray that he would also give you the gift of interpretation. So the Lord does desire for us to pray for these. And it does edify the church. And it's such a powerful thing when you think about the Holy Spirit of God speaking to us. And it's a a very special time of reverence. I know that growing up, the whole entire room would get quiet. We would, the little babies would get hushed. Nobody dared move because the Spirit of God was moving and, and God Almighty speaking to his people And what could be more important than hearing what God has to say in that moment? The whole room would be completely still, just waiting to hear what the Lord has to say. It's a very special gift to have, as all of them are. And I know there are other people in this church who operate in the gift of discernment and the gift of wisdom. We are thankful for those that do. So I just want to encourage you to press in to seek for these if if you don't have a gift, if you're struggling to see what it is God's called you to have, no matter what he's called you to do, just press in that he would show you and be able to use you in that because we need you as a body. We need you operating in what God has called you to do because we need all the parts working together in unity to fulfill the call as a church, not just your individual call, but when we all come together, fulfilling what he's called us to do as a church. So verse 11, this is one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. If the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, 
He who raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit who dwells in you. Say, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The spirit, the same spirit of Jesus Christ lives inside of me. The same spirit that raised him from the dead. (laughs) Glory to God. Miracle working power inside of me. Hallelujah, to quicken my mortal body. Glory to God. To make this mortal body capable of doing incredible things. Things we never thought imaginable or possible. But with God, we know all things are possible through His Spirit. There are things He desires to do in you. And I'm telling you what, I know the days of miracles aren't over. I know it's meant for the church today. I want to see it take place. I want to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. I want to see my sons and daughters prophesy. Glory to to God. Hallelujah. I want to see his spirit poured out and I just can't for the life of me understand why anybody would want to be a cessationalist. These people believe that the gifts are not for today. They believe that it was only for the early church. They don't believe in spiritual gifts. They don't believe in tongues or prophecy. They don't believe that healing is for today. And then They dare to have these conferences and want you to spend a bunch of money to come. And I'm like, for what? Come for what? If you don't even believe anything's going to happen when I get there, why do I want to be there? (laughs) Glory to God. Help us. Lord, help us understand. Somebody needs to explain this to me. Why wouldn't you want it? It's available and it is still happening in the church. How can you deny that? I want to feel the power of the Holy Spirit inside of me. I want to pray in the Spirit. I want to see signs and wonders and miracles. We serve a big God who desires to work his might and wonders in this earth. Why wouldn't we desire to see that? I do not understand. I believe what the Word of God says. That in the last days, and you know, when Peter stood up in Acts chapter 2 and he said that, he said, this is that that was spoken of. By the prophet Joel in the last days. So if they believe those were the last days, then we are truly living in the last of the last days. And if it was for them then, it's still for us now. He never stopped working. I think we just stopped believing. I think we need to let faith arise once again so the church can be the church. Because he's coming back and it's going to happen. It's already been prophesied that our sons and daughters would prophesy. That young men would see visions and old men would dream dreams. That there would be wonders in heaven and in earth and blood, fire, vapor, smoke. That the sun would be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. And it said, whosoever, whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Glory to God. Everyone qualifies for the blood of Jesus. Whosoever calls on his name will be saved. And I'm ready. I'm ready to see a mighty harvest. I'm ready to go and tell him that he saves. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Who will come and go with me? Let's go. Let's do it. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He is with us. He is in us. And he has gone before us. What fear should we have? There is no need. Glory to God. And prophecy is being fulfilled everywhere. Everyone is watching Israel right now. Watching them closely. Another thing I don't understand. Why anti-Semitism is rising up. Never before in my life. And when I speak with elders, they say never before in this country. Have we ever seen so many people turning their back on Israel? It's hitting very close to home. Our nation has always supported Israel. We've never had a doubt that our president, whoever he might have been at the time, would stand up and declare that we're on Israel's side. And now we have this fear, this very real fear, that we're turning our back on God's chosen people. He is still in covenant with them. I know that that they crucified their Messiah, yes. 
and they have paid dearly and, and will continue to do so until they as a nation do finally see, but God still has a plan for them. And we are commanded in his word to pray for peace in Jerusalem. We're commanded in his word. He says, those who will stand for Israel, I will stand for them. Those who curse them, I will curse them. God forbid. We've got to pay attention to what's happening. It's hitting very close to home. We heard about a gas station in Vaden that had put up a sign in their window that said that we do not support Israel. I mean, that's really close. That's really close to home. I can't understand. I can't for the life of me understand what's happening. I've had such a burden on my heart for Israel, a burden for our country. We need to pray, and we need to pray like never before. This nation needs revival. This nation needs a reformation. We need a change. We've got to turn our hearts back to Jesus. We've got to pray that the church would rise up in these last days. We know the word of God says he's not coming back for a weak church, a scared church. Satan wants to keep us isolated and he wants to keep us in fear and confused. And he's just had his way with the church the past few years. But I just feel it rising up in me that those days are no more. It is time to be bold. It is time to take a stand. It is time to take the church back. Awake from slumber and rise up a mighty army. Holy Spirit, breathe on us once again. Hallelujah. He's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. Oh, glory to God, a mighty army. Hallelujah. And I want to be in that number. I want to be a part of it. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Before Christ's death, the Holy Spirit could not live inside of an individual. The Bible speaks about how the Holy Spirit would help individuals fulfill God's call. That he would come upon them, the Spirit came upon them, or the Spirit was with them. But now, because of the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit can live in us. And we see that the Spirit of God has always been since the very beginning. You know, the Word of God talks about how Jesus Christ is the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. That he was already there in heaven with the Lord. That there's always been this plan in place. And even in the very very first book of the Bible in the book of Genesis 1 and 2, the Bible says that the Spirit moved. It was the Spirit of God that moved upon the face of the earth. As God the Father gave the command, it was the Spirit that carried out these works that created everything in seven days, and six days, because on the seventh day he rested, but it was by his spirit. Only God has the power to create. Through his spoken word, he speaks to his Holy Spirit, and then his spirit carries out those actions. When God, the Father, speaks, things happen. Now, I, I do believe that we need to be careful about the things that we speak. The Word of God says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. But as I was studying this out, I got to thinking, you know, it's not our Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit of God that's carrying out these actions. So with our words, we can't really create anything because we don't in us have that kind of power. We have the Holy Spirit's power. When we speak things that are in accordance with the will of God, then things can happen because God willed it. He allowed it. But it's not like we can just come up with things and and think that out of our own power or ability, we can force God's hand to create something that we want. If we are in line with the word of God, then yes, we need to speak that in accordance to the word of God. We need to be careful about the things that we say, because the thoughts that we have and the things that we are saying, if they aren't lining up with the word of God, we're actually tearing down the kingdom of God and we're allowing Satan to have his way in our lives. So I do understand the need to subject ourselves to the Spirit so that in our witness, in our conduct, in the things we speak, and in the way our mind operates, that we are in line with the Spirit. And then when you are praying according to the will of God, when you are using the Word of God, when, when you are encouraging yourself in the Lord and you're quoting these scriptures, you have His power of the Holy Spirit working in you to strengthen, encourage, and empower you. 
Do you understand what I'm saying by that? Glory to God. Amen. All right. Verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh. We are no longer bound to the flesh. We are not indebted to the flesh to live after the flesh. We are indebted to Christ alone. And we can never repay what it is that he has done for us. He did a work that only he could do. We could not pay the price. We are helpless, hopeless without him. Understanding that we owed a debt that we couldn't pay. But he was the only one who could pay the price. And he didn't really owe it. It was our debt. But he took our place because of his great love for us. Matthew 16 and 25, it tells us that whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. And that leads me to verse 13. If we live after the flesh, we will die. But if you through the spirit do mortify, do kill the deeds of the, of the body, you shall live. More abundant life in Christ. We're not trying to save our own selves. We understand we're completely dependent on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that is the only way to have life and life more abundantly. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Hallelujah. That is the proof. That is the fruit. That you truly are saved. That you are of God because His Spirit is living in you and it is evident. If you have not received, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. We are not bound to that spirit. We have received the spirit of adoption. Glory to God, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, we have been grafted in. We have been counted in. Glory to God. And we can call him Abba, Father. Hallelujah. The Spirit himself bears witness. The Spirit himself confirms to us. It confirms in our spirit that we are the children of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Do you know you're a child of God? Do you know that you know that you know his Spirit is living inside of you? Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchased by God, born of his spirit, and I'm washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. Oh, this is my song. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. What assurance. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And if children and heirs, heirs of God and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Hallelujah. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials seem so small, but when we see Christ, one glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely, bravely run the race till we see Christ. Oh, yes, I can't wait for that day. But let me tell you, it's already worth it all. If just one more soul comes to Christ because of our efforts, because of what we've done, if one more soul were to walk down the aisle, it would be worth every struggle, worth every mile. A lifetime of labor is still worth it all if it rescues just one more soul. Hallelujah. Glory to God.
Give us souls, Lord Jesus, we pray, oh God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Though the tests and trials may come in this life, we may have to walk through some hard times. I'm so glad I get to walk it with Jesus. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. It's inevitable that troubles are going to find us. And as I've walked through trials in my life, I've often thought about how much harder it would be if I didn't have the Lord on my side. I'm so thankful that he said, I will leave my spirit with you. That I will give you a greater, I will give you a comforter who will help you. I'm not leaving you helpless. I am so glad he said he would be with us. Never leave us or forsake us. Glory to God. And I think about those who are out there in this world who are going through the same thing and they don't have that kind of help. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where I would be today. I just think that the things of this world are much too heavy to carry. And we have the answer. And how selfish of us just to hoard it up for ourselves, just to be so inwardly focused. We got to go. We got to tell them we have the answer, that we have the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you what he's done for me. He can do it for you too. They need to know they're out there searching for the answer. I don't want their blood to be on my hands. I'm not trying to scare you tonight, but it's a very heavy, weighty matter. We need to be ever mindful. I don't care your age. This call never expires. I don't care how old you are. He still wants to use you. If there is breath in your body, you can tell somebody about Jesus. And I don't care how young you are. If you've been saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, you qualify. There is something that you can do for the Lord. You can go and you can tell. Hallelujah. I'm just so thankful that he's with us. I'm so thankful for the call that he's placed on us that we get to be a part of this. You know, it's not necessarily so much that he needs us as much as we need him. But I'm just thankful he includes us in his kingdom, that he gives us the opportunity to be used by him because there is no greater life. There is nothing greater. And he's called you for a purpose. There is a reason why you, why you are here. He desires to use you. There are great things he has in store for you. I hope that you understand that tonight. He loves you and he is for you, not against you. And he has placed you here to be a part of this body. And if you would just yield yourself to what it is that he has for you to do, there is a place at the table for you, a place with your name on it. Nobody can take that place from you. Nobody can impersonate as you. God knows that they're in your seat and he'll take care of it. Glory to God. There's room for all. And the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And I just want to see God moving in each and every one of us. I want God to, I want to see God moving in you. You fulfilling the call that he's placed on your life. I want to see us as believers being strengthened. And I want him to raise us up. I just can't. I can't believe how good the Lord is, and I can't wait to see what he's going to do. Hallelujah. Can we agree on that tonight? Are you looking forward to the future? Not with fear. Let's all stand tonight. Glory to God. Great days are ahead for this body. Great days are ahead for the church. I believe it. You're called for such a time as this. I just feel faith arising in me as this old world is given into darkness. The light that's in us is going to shine even brighter. Don't think that he doesn't have a plan for these days. He's still on the throne. He's not up there scratching his head, worried or wondered, wondering what's going to happen next, what the devil's got up his sleeve. He's just got the same old tricks. And God is aware of everything that has taken place. And you can put your life in his hands and you can rest assured that he is in control and he's taking care of you. Glory to God. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. We thank you for the time that we've had together, Lord. I just pray, Father, that we could use this, Lord. 
that we could take this, Father, that somehow, Lord, you will find a way to bring about opportunities for us to share your gospel. Give us boldness, Lord. Give us strength. Open doors and opportunities, Lord, and help us to walk through them when the time comes that you would give us the words to speak, Lord, that you would give us that blessed assurance, that you would empower us, Lord, with boldness as never before, oh God, to unashamedly declare, oh, we know you are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are seated high upon the throne, knowing, Lord, that as we submit to you, as we yield to your spirit, as we learn how to walk in your spirit, that you will lead, you will direct us, you will guide us, Lord, into all truth. Father, we pray for discernment in these last days, for we know, Lord, that evil is rising up. We know that in the last days they will call evil good and good evil. We know that there will be wolves in sheep's clothing that are coming to devour the sheep. Help us, Lord, to protect the flock. Help us, Lord, to take a stand, Lord Jesus. You have laid this mantle upon us, and we don't take it lightly, Lord. Let it begin in us, we pray. Oh, let a fire start in us, oh, Lord God. Oh, let it burn bright, Lord, that all may see, Lord God, that they would give you glory for the things that you're doing. Grow that good fruit in us. Let it be undeniably of you, oh, God, that they will say they know that we have been with you, that we are in your presence, oh, God, that you are going with us, that you are making a way, oh, God. We trust in you. No matter what may come, Lord, we know that you are still on the throne and you are in control. And we love you tonight, Lord. We just thank you for all that you've given us, all that you've already done and all that you're going to do in our lives, Lord. I just pray for these people. I pray you would strengthen them, encourage them, Lord. Don't let them live in fear. Meet their needs. Let them know, oh God, that you are there. Let them know, Lord, that you are for them, not against them. And draw them in in a way, Lord, that they can feel your presence. As never before, Lord, as evil rises up, oh God, I just pray you pour out your spirit upon us even more, oh God, because you are the greater one and you live in us, Father. And we know that greater is he who is in us than he that is in this world, Lord. So we're encouraged tonight in you and we thank you for it, Father God. We give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord.